Well, good evening to you all and welcome to what promises to be a fascinating forum tonight, Must Read Histories. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a very busy time of year and judging by your numbers, it appears that there's, I guess, a, a mutual consent to the view that we must read histories. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the country on which we gather this evening, the Wanjiri people and their elders past and present. I must admit that the topic for tonight's discussion uh, did give me pause for reflection. Uh, <clears throat> like the notorious Desert Island Discs exercise or nominating your pet child when all parents know that we're not allowed to play favourites, a whittling down a library of treasures to a single volume is um, a special kind of torture. And I, I think it's particularly so if, like me, you are educated to reject the very idea of a privileged list uh, an ordained few. Um, I went through my tertiary education at a time when a belief in the canon was deeply unfashionable. Uh, this was the age of postmodernism where the diversity of perspective was paramount. We were drip fed the idea that there was no truth, only the subjective construction of narratives. Every story became a choose your own adventure of deconstruction and ethnographic empathy. Somehow I managed to get through a BA, an MA, and a PhD in Australian history without ever reading a single text by Manning Clark, or Keith Hancock, or Ernest Scott, or Geoffrey Blaney, the, the big men on the modernist campus of nation building. But with the political tide now turning behind a national history curriculum, it's pertinent to consider, I think, whether there might be a return to the canon, uh, the works that everyone must be familiar with in order to understand the essential historical question, who we are and how we came to be that way. If so, what might our great big 21st century desert island reading list look like? Well, tonight our spyglass to the past and perhaps to the future is in good hands indeed. Um, though it's worth noting, I think, that um, of our, our three speakers, only one holds academic qualifications in the discipline of history. Um, Stuart McIntyre is our token historian tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Marsha Langton is, a quali is qualified as an anthropologist and a geographer, and Tim Supamazan is a political scientist and philosopher. Um, I think this is a salient point because it shows that not only historians read history books, that the study of history influences our ideas and our thinking in a range of professional and lay pursuits. Um, and it also goes without saying that the reach of history writing goes well beyond the learned academies, uh, with the general reading public displaying a castaway's appetite for historical non-fiction, particularly military history and biography. So to kick us off tonight, we're going to start with Stuart McIntyre. Just a brief introduction, many of you will know Stuart and his work. Professor Stuart McIntyre is one of Australia's most eminent historians. He has held academic appointments at Cambridge University, the ANU and the University of Melbourne, where he has been the Ernest Scott Professor of History since 1990. He was made a Laureate Professor of Melbourne University in 2002. Stuart has an international reputation as a scholar of Australian history and in 2007 was a visiting professor of Australian studies at Harvard University. Since 2009, Stuart has been a professorial research fellow of the Australian Research Council. Stuart is best known for his writing on aspects of Australian labour history, political history and historiography. He's written 14 much-loved and debated books, including The Reds, The Communist Party of Australia from Origins to Illegality, True Believers, The Story of the Federal Parliamentary Labour Party, which he co-edited with Senator John Faulkner, The Concise History of Australia, which has been through four editions and has been translated into Chinese, Japanese and Italian, uh, the History Wars, which was co-written with Anna Clark, and that won the Queensland Premier's Literary Award and the New South Wales Premier's History Award in 2004. He's also the co-writer of the sometimes refutable but always indispensable Oxford Companion to Australian History. Stuart's currently involved in a large-scale international project documenting the history of historical writing. So as a man who has obviously read more than his fair share of history books, it is with great pleasure 
and even greater curiosity that I welcome Stuart McIntyre to share with us his must-read history. Thank you, Claire. Well, thank you, Claire, and you've put well my reservations about the nature of the exercise when you're asked to choose one book that will best capture Australian history. Your natural instinct is to say that's to give a misleading understanding of uh, uh, how history works. Um, but I was persuaded by the very persuasive Alex and by you that it was worth attempting. Um, why, why my reservations? I'll be interested to see if Marcia and Tim share them. Um, well, I think it's partly that um, I'm very suspicious of the idea that there can be a definitive history of Australia. Uh, yes, we can talk about um, Australian characteristics. We might even nominate some distinctive ones. But to talk about a definitive history um, that captures Australianness comes uncomfortably close to you know, the ideas of being un-Australian or in a local context, uh, as a former Premier once put it, un-Victorian or even un-Hawthorne, which I think is <laughs> probably the greatest of the offences in his eyes. Um, that is, different histories have been written at different times for different audiences, and there's no single unified audience at any one time. If you um, wanted to get an understanding of Australian history that an earlier generation of British historians um, understood and practised, then you probably would go to Keith Hancock's book, uh, written 80 years ago. If you wanted to write a history about the aspirations to an independent nationhood, you'd probably take uh, Russell Ward's The Australian Legend, and indeed I think Tim has taken it and he'll talk about why. Uh, those who wanted an Australian history with greater spiritual depth, I think, turned to Manning Clark. Um, those who are more um, interested in uh, an Irish Catholic identity would go to, to uh, um, Pat O'Farrell's work. Um, when people began to think about the um, uh, masculinity of these forms of history, well, I suppose you would think of early works such as Miriam Dixon's The Real Matilda, or that collaborative book that Pat Grimshaw and others wrote some time ago now called Creating a Nation. And if you wanted to incorporate the much longer and deeper past, well, then you might be thinking of uh, The First Australians that was edited by Rachel Perkins and by Marcia. In the end, I decided, with all those caveats and reservations, that I would nominate Brian Fitzpatrick's The Australian Commonwealth. Now, I suppose the first question that follows from that was, who was Brian <laughs> Fitzpatrick? Just as a guide to me, um, how many people are familiar with Brian Fitzpatrick's work? Could you let me know? A few. Probably it might pick it up for those at the back. There's the book, long been out of print. Well, Brian Fitzpatrick um, was born in rural Victoria, uh, grew up in Mooney Ponds, um, born in 1905. Uh, by scholarships, he got to Melbourne University and subsequently got a scholarship to go to London in the late 20s. Um, he then went into journalism. In the 1930s, he worked for Rupert Murdoch's father on the uh, Melbourne uh, Evening Daily, The Herald. But by this time, he was both a radical and a bohemian, and he abandoned professional journalism in the late 1930s to do two things. First of all, he created the Australian Council for Civil Liberties. He was preoccupied by what he thought was a threat to freedom at that time. And secondly, he became a freelance historian who wrote two big and important books about Australian economic history and its imperial dimension, the way in which the relationship with Britain had defined it, but which, in which, as he put it in one of his popularisations, this was a story of a struggle for power between the organised rich and the organised poor. Even though Brian Fitzpatrick uh, wrote those books, which were important in the, at the time they were published, he was unable to find any um, permanent academic employment. He lived by a series of part-time and casual jobs. By the 1950s, when he wrote this book, he was drinking heavily. He tended to get up early and come to this library and work through the morning and perhaps the early afternoon. And then he would join his friends in a pub in Swanson Street and get home sometime later in the evening. Um, now, the Australian Commonwealth, um, which was published in 1956, is a sort of an odd book. 
Um, it's a series of historical sketches of what he calls a picture of the community in the 20th century. And it's um, unconventional also in that it mixes, if you like, um, descriptions and analysis with commentary and digression. The back half of the book consists of all sorts of further information or afterthoughts or where you might go further. He organised his book into chapters, of which the first was the land, the second was the home, the third chapter was speech, the fourth was children, um, the fifth he called disinherited Australians, and that was principally a study of the uh, struggle for Aboriginal rights as it had evolved in the uh, early 1950s. And here I should say that Brian Fitzpatrick, I think, took a view of what you call a civil libertarian view, that there were forms of discrimination um, that were imposed on Aborigines, but he was never, I think, neither comprehended nor sympathised with the idea of an Aboriginal cultural identity. I could talk about that further if you like. He then, uh, the, there's a chapter on class, there was a chapter on politics, uh, there was a chapter on rights and liberties. <laughs> you can readily think of things that have been set out. I mean, Brian Fitzpatrick was a misogynist, and although there was some attention to patterns of uh, gender relations in some of the chapters, he regarded it as incidental. His final chapter was called Towards Civilization, and I can give an idea of what he was trying to do just by briefly explaining it. He finishes by saying, Australian history cannot make much of a case for Australian achievement on the score of conventional leadership. Um, he <coughs> says, by and large, the public personage in Australian regard figures more typically as a byword than a watchword. There were exceptions, he says, and he then describes four of them. Um, and he attributes particular qualities to each one of them. The four Australians he identifies, in fact, are Isaac Isaacs, um, H.B. Higgins of the Harvest of Judgment, uh, Alfred Deacon and John Monash. Um, um, he says that these were people who were identifiable nation builders with, and they were imaginative persons. They invested the Australian community structure, he said, with its distinctive style. But having identified them, his final paragraph, and you could see he'd spent some time thinking about it, went along these lines. Finally, as in the beginning, there were the people who took some favourable note of those four, two of whom were Jews, if few more. The people were in one aspect the mob, or hoi polloi, in another the diggers who fought at Marathon. The Australian people made heroes of none and raised no idols, except perhaps an outlaw, Ned Kelly, and carbine a horse. We'd probably want to revise that these days. But generation of them after generation, they fought with the beasts of the faeces, blight and drought, fire and flood, their own taskmasters and the covetous aliens, and suffering their setbacks, still made of Australia a home good enough for men of modest report to live in, calling their souls their own. Brian Fitzpatrick is often taken to be a romantic nationalist, someone who thought that, as he put it, something irrecoverable past from Australian community life at the end of the 19th century, uh, when the working class was both formed and harnessed to state institutions and to reformism. And I think he composed that paragraph as a lasting affirmation of his faith, and even in a vestigial form, I think it tells you something about Australian community life. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stuart. I should say that we're going to run all of the speakers tonight together and then have discussion and take questions all at the end. Uh, our next speaker tonight is Marcia Langton. Prof Professor Marcia Langton has held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since February 2000. Prior to that, she spent five years as a Ranger Professor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies at Charles Darwin University in Darwin. She holds a PhD in Geography from Macquarie University. Her own research has, con has concerned Indigenous relationships with place, land tenure, environmental management and agreement making. <coughs> 
She is well known and either feared or admired, sometimes both, as an outspoken advocate for the rights of Indigenous people in Australia. Marcy has advised in a policy capacity for many government and non-government agencies, including the Central Land Council, the Australian Film Commission, the Northern Territory Aboriginals <laughs> Issues Unit, where she worked on the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. In 1993, Marcy's academic and advocacy work was recognised when she was made a member of the Order of Australia. Marcy's co-authored books include Settling with Indigenous People, Modern Treaty and Agreement Making, Honour Among Nations, Treaties and Agreements with Indigenous People and Black Lines, Contemporary Critical Writing by Indigenous Australians. She also has more than 40 book chapters and scholarly articles to her name. It's always a treat to find out what is exciting Marcia Langton's prodigious intellect, so it's with great anticipation that I invite her now to share with us her must-read history. Uh, thank you. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners. Uh, I, I chose what contentious journal uh, a narrative of the founding of Sydney. Um, it's, it's very much available. Um, unfortunately for me, um, the, it was uh, turned into a, a modern classic uh, entitled 1788, which is you know, quite a good title to give it, um, by our uh, environmentalist friend, um, whose name I promptly forgot. Tim Flannery. Tim Flannery. Tim Flannery. That's it. Um, now you, you know, perhaps the audience were wondering why I didn't choose a work by an Aboriginal author. Well, I was asked which book would I um, put on the must-read list. Well. If, of, of Australian histories. Well, it's not technically a history. I know enough about history to know that it's not a history. It's a journal, so therefore it's a primary document. But uh, if you're interested in history, as I am, then you know history comes from the primary sources. And when I studied history at the ANU many years ago, um, I, uh, my first lecturer uh, was an expert on the Home Office and that was how history was taught in those days. Uh, the only leg legitimate subject was something to do with the British presence in Australia. By second year I was lucky enough to have Campbell McKnight who uh, had, had, had written the voyage to Marigi about the, the Macassans coming to Australia and, and that whole saga. Um, so uh, by the end of second year, I was pretty much sick of British history, I can tell you. Um, but I discovered Tench in a completely different way. I was looking for references to Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people's encounters with alcohol. And I can't remember who it was, but it was certainly an anthropologist who said to me, well, you know, go to the, uh, the journals. So I did, and I, I picked up Watkins Tench, and just like a young friend who texted me this morning, um, I told him which book I'd picked, I couldn't put it down. Um, and uh, now having read as much as I, I have over the last 40 years since f first reading it, well, probably about 35 years. Um, uh, I would still say that it's absolutely my favourite text. If every observer of uh, encounters between Aboriginal people and the settlers throughout the nation's history and colonial history had been as observant, compassionate and witty as Tench, we would have had Aboriginal histories long before those first works that came out in the 1960s. I was told flatly, without qualification in first year history, that there couldn't be 
a history of Aboriginal people. And that stayed with me, as you might have figured out. Um, uh, and indeed, in Manning, one of Manning Clark's volumes, um, I think it's the end of the first chapter, he too says there can be no history of Aboriginal people because they had no history. But you know, the point is, and it was Mulvaney who taught me this, um, the great prehistorian. I, I studied archaeology under him. History is to be found, you know, by taking the adventure into books and interpreting what happened. So I, must, I became fascinated by the character of Benelong because it was Benelong to whom um, Philip, Captain Philip, in 1788, gave wine, not rum, a glass of wine. Um, and in, at his dinner table, he was the only Aboriginal person invited to eat dinner with the captain. And he was taught how to toast the king. And everybody else was given rum. But um, so, so Benelong was favoured, and I mean, obviously, for you know, quasi-military reasons. And, and also so that you know, people could find out about the country. And they were hoping that he would be an informant. And so this was Tench's role. Tench was an officer, obviously highly literate. I'm going to just read you some experts, uh, excerpts from his journal. But I just wanted to say that um, it would be impossible to understand Benelong without Tench's lucid account of those extraordinary events at Port Jackson. It was Tench who wrote of Benelong, for instance, uh, love and war seemed his favourite pursuits. And throughout his journals, there's sage wit and acute observation, the kind of observations that anthropologists love. And, and these are so characteristic of Tench. I mean, certainly I think, you know, the surgeon Worgan's journal is, is great too, but none are as lucid and as a, filled with observations, humour, pathos, compassion as Tench's narrative. Um, he, he, he has a delightful way of evoking the farcical aspects of the events, even if they're brutal. Uh, his, his, his record sparkles with precision. Each word is apt. Um, and you know, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that he's a subtle and intelligent observer of the ev events unfolding around him. And I regard him as much as a, a founder of Australia as Benelong and Governor Philip. And I think it's essential that Australians read Watkins Tench, um, and I regard it as a founding document. Now, <clears throat> it, what delighted me 35 years ago when I read it in the, the research library at the ANU was that contrary to everything I had been taught, here were the facts of Aboriginal history in this journal. So, um, you know, of course, leaving aside Captain Cook's journal, because he really, he, you know, scooted past Sydney, he didn't even go into the harbour. Um, his journals are more interesting for his encounter at uh, Palm Island and Endeavour River, actually. <coughs> um, <coughs> so I'll just, I'll just read you uh, a little. Uh, I'm sure many people here have read it. Who's read it? Oh, five people, <laughs> including the professor. Um, okay, so <clears throat> Watkins Tench complained that you know he 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 was he went ashore three days after the ship arriving um, um, in the harbour. Um, And uh, he went with a party to the south side of the harbour where they met, or were met by, quote, a dozen Indians, nakers, naked as at the moment of their birth, walking along the beach. Um, he, uh, he had a, a seven-year-old child with him. Um, and his party of marines armed with muskets and other weapons, quote, advanced with caution towards them, um, 
nor would they at first approach nearer to us than the distance of some paces. The locals were armed with a variety of spears, mostly fishing spears, yet an attack seemed as unlikely on their part as we knew it would be on our own. Um, so then he goes on, the child seemed to attract their attention very much for they frequently pointed to him and spoke to each other. And as he was not f frightened, I advanced with him towards them at the same time bearing his bosom and showing the whiteness of, it, shooing the whiteness of his skin. On the clothes being removed, they gave a loud exclamation and one of the party, an old man with a long beard, hideous ugly, came close to us. I bade my little charge not to be afraid and introduced him to the acquaintance of this uncouth personage. The Indian, with great gentleness, laid his hand on the child's hat and afterwards felt his clothes, muttering to himself all the while. I found it necessary, however, by this time to send away the child, as such a close connection rather alarmed him. And in this, as the conclusion verified, I gave no offence to the old gentleman. Indeed, it was but putting ourselves on a par with them, as I had observed from the first, that some youths of their own, though considerably older than the one with us, were kept back by the grown people. Several more now came up to whom we made various presents, but our toys seemed not to be regarded as very valuable, nor would they for a long time make any returns to them. Though before we parted, a large club with a head almost sufficient to fell an ox was in, obtained in exchange for a looking glass. These people seemed at a loss to know, probably from our want of beards, of what sex we were. And of course then follows the hilarious incident when the locals asked, to have a look, and uh, one of the party had to take his pants down. Um, and Worgan's account of that is terribly funny. But you know, you get immediately the the, the sense of the man. He was kind. He was gentle. He was, you know, um, very accomplished uh, uh, in socialising with people of any type. Um, and, 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 you know, able to relate to people of all ages and show a great compassion for them. Uh, his account, much, much later, of many incidents, but one in particular stands out for me, and that is the, the, when Philip, who, you know, starts out with great intentions, um, kind intentions, and, and is rather success, successful at his mission, with the murder of his gatekeeper, or gamekeeper, sorry, um, by an Aboriginal man from the south, um, probably because the gamekeeper was a rapist, um, although we can't be sure, then orders Tension, a party, to go and get the heads of Aboriginal people. Tench tries to talk him out of it, doesn't succeed, and then heads off into the swamps to the south, and he thinks, well, he, he, he clearly believes from the outset that this is not just an immoral mission, but dangerous in, because it puts the whole exercise of establishing a colony, at, a penal colony at risk, but also he just doesn't want to do it. Um, so there's such a droll wit in the way that he describes his encounter, and you can read between the lines to see that what he's in fact doing is deliberately leading people astray. Um, and alas, we returned without the heads. Um, I, I, all through his work, there are the most extraordinary details, um, you know, and, and you know, there are quite a few journals from this period. Um, I note that Keith Vincent Smith thinks my work's a copy of Inga Klingenden. That's not actually the case. Um, and, you know, there are people like Keith Vincent Smith who greatly influenced my reading of Tench and also Inga Klingend, and, um, you know, I can, you can be sure that she influenced me. But, um, you know, there's a lot more to what happened in Sydney than people being nice to each other. Um, there were some pretty brutal encounters, and, and Tench doesn't... Um, 
I'm sorry, I've gone way over time. No, but we um, will have to. Does, doesn't doesn't pull his punches? I think I, you know he describes, for instance, uh, rapes, bashings of women, um, but always in such an intelligent, observant, and droll way. Um, and you know you come away from it feeling like you've just lived through the period. So. Uh, uh, that's my favourite text, and I think everybody should read it, and I don't understand why it's not on the curriculum. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia, and maybe it will be on the curriculum when the new national curriculum rolls around. Our next, <coughs> our next speaker tonight is Tim Supamazan. Dr. Tim Suparmazan is a graduate of Sydney University and Oxford University where he earned an MA in philosophy and a PhD in political theory. His fields of scholarly expertise include nationalism, multiculturalism and democracy. Tim has worked as a political speechwriter for former Premier of New South Wales Bob Carr and on the staff of the then opposition leader Kevin Rudd during the 2007 election campaign. He's worked as a leader writer for the Financial Times and The Guardian, and his public commentary has appeared in The Monthly, The Spectator, and almost all of Australia's daily newspapers. Name one, and Tim will have published in it. Uh, he'll be known to many of you for his regular Ask the Philosopher column in The Weekend Australian, which is a bit of a misnomer, I reckon, because um, members of the public don't actually ask you questions like, my neighbour keeps putting their rubbish in my wheelie bin. Is it morally equivalent to set fire to their standard roses? <laughs> uh, I reckon you should get a bit of Danny Katz in there. Um, Tim is the author of Reclaiming Patriotism, which was shortlisted in the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards in, 19, in 2010. And the judges praise that book for taking a fresh approach to issues around identity, race, politics and citizenship. Tim is also the co-author of All That's Left, What Labor Should Stand For, which was launched in November 2010. The Age called it a must for the PM's summer reading list. <laughs> Tim's next book, The Virtuous Citizen, will be published by Cambridge University Press in 2012, so look out for that one. Tim's currently a research fellow at Monash University's National Centre for Australian Studies and a senior project leader at the per capita think tank. As part of his research at Monash University, Tim is a chief investigator on an ARC Research Council project studying the history of Anzac Day. Tim is known as one of the brightest stars in a new constellation of Australian intellectuals, so it's with great anticipation that we ask him to divulge his must-read history. Thanks very much, Claire. It's a dangerous thing to suggest, as Stuart says, that there can be a definitive history of any nation, uh, quite simply because the history of any nation is an ongoing project. A national story is always a work in progress. Nonetheless, I've chosen a book whose author's aspiration was uh, really to suggest that there was, if not a definitive sense of Australian character, then, at the very least, a very distinctive sense of Australian character. I've chosen Russell Ward's The Australian Legend, which uh, was published in 1958, but had its life as, well, began its life as a doctoral thesis for Russell Ward. And the doctoral thesis, I think, uh, sums up the analytic uh, or historical argument quite well. It was called The Ethos and Influence of the Australian Pastoral Worker. Uh, I'm curious, who, who has read Russell Ward's The Australian Legend? I know that um, the previous, my previous panellists have, have asked the same question. Um, who was Russell Ward? Well, Russell Ward uh, was a historian. He came from a conservative uh, bourgeois family in uh, Adelaide. His father was a schoolmaster and a lay Methodist preacher. Uh, historians have described Russell Ward as having somewhat of a military bearing. Uh, more than one person uh, has described him as something of a, of a British army officer in character. I think he was mustachioed, if that mm -hmm. uh, gives yes. you uh, any sense of uh, the man. There's an irony here in that he was really a radical nationalist uh, 
historian. So uh, as John Hurst, I think, put it in an introduction to one of the editions of the Australian legend, uh, the apostle of Australian radical nationalism, uh, for one, for, by all appearances, looked like an army officer from Britain. Uh, he was a radical. He joined the Communist Party in 1941, but left uh, in 1949. But his communist radical history would follow him throughout the rest of his life. He was denied uh, a lectureship at what was then the University of Technology in New South Wales, which is now uh, UNSW. Uh, he would spend, though, his academic career as a professor of history at the University of New England. Now, those who haven't read the Australian legend will nonetheless have an instinctive feel for what it may involve. Uh, if I were to mention characters such as uh, the man from Snowy River uh, or mention Crocodile Dundee, uh, I think you'll get a sense of the kind of national character that Ross Ward uh, wrote about. For me, I, uh, whenever I think about the, the kind of national characteristics that Ross Ward uh, dealt with, I, uh, this probably reflects the kind of viewing that I uh, enjoyed as a young child in the 1980s, but I always think of Brian Brown in uh, The Shira Lee. I don't know if you saw that TV miniseries, but I always think of, uh, of Brian Brown in that series as a kind of representative of uh, the sort of character that Russell uh, Ward wrote about. But I think there's no better indication of what Russell Ward took to be the distinctive aspects of an Australian national character uh, there's no better way of conveying that than just to go to Russell Ward himself. Uh, and the great thing about this book is he actually declares it pretty early on uh, in the book. He says, the typical Australian is a practical man, rough and ready in his manners and quick to decry any appearance of affectation in others. He's a great improviser, ever willing to have a go at anything, but willing too to be content with a task done in a way that is near enough. Though capable of great exertion in an emergency, he normally feels no impulse to work hard without good cause. <laughs> he swears hard and consistently, gambles heavily and often, and drinks deeply on occasion. Though he is the world's best confidence man, he is usually taciturn rather than talkative, one who endures stoically rather than one who acts busily. He is a hard case, sceptical about the value of religion and of intellectual and cultural pursuits generally. He believes that Jack isn't only as good as his master, but at least in principle, probably a good deal better. And so he's a great knocker of eminent people, unless, as in the case of his sporting heroes, they are distinguished by physical prowess. He's a fiercely independent person who hates officiousness and authority, especially when these qualities are embodied in military officers and policemen. Yet he's very hospitable and above all, will stick to his mates through thick and thin, even if he thinks they may be in the wrong. No epithet in his vocabulary is more completely damning than scab, and so on and so forth. Um, now, I couldn't summarise that any better than uh, Russell Ward put it there, I think. Now, in the Australian legend, Russell Ward goes through the sources of, of this uh, mystique, this national character, and he finds it in the history uh, that comes with a convict, working class, Irish uh, and native born national tradition. Uh, but one that reached its, reaches, as he puts it, its apotheosis in the uh, 1890s in the form of the bush worker, uh, the itinerant uh, shearer, uh, shepherd, uh, drover, stockman, uh, the kind of guy that uh, Brian Brown indeed represented in uh, the Shira Lee. Uh, but in the 1890s, it reached its apogee because it was given literary expression through figures such as Joseph Furphy, uh, Banjo Patterson, uh, Henry Lawson. Uh, but Ward argues that it wasn't obviously a, a character that emerged only in the 1890s, but rather it was always uh, there and it had layers added to it uh, through various phases, whether it was the conflict uh, phase of Australian history, whether it was uh, the gold rush, whether it was bush rangers, and indeed whether it was the period leading up to federation. Now in analytic terms, uh, the argument amounted to a radical nationalist case. By this, I mean that Ward was trying to suggest that the Australian national identity 
uh, well, Australian national character, Australian national culture, uh, had a freestanding, organic provenance that Australian culture wasn't derivative of Britishness. And he grounded this in the common folk, in folk traditions. Uh, so there's a lot, for example, in this book about folk songs uh, and the idea that uh, there was always a primordial sense, almost, of a character that was expressed through song. Now, I came to this book rather late, uh, in about 2003, 2004. Uh, I came to it because I was studying national identity uh, and trying to work out, in my, in my mind, uh, what a national identity could involve in a multicultural society uh, or context. Uh, but as I began studying uh, this and began reading, I became very interested in notions of cultural nationalism and romanticism. Uh, for example, I, I have a great interest in the work of Herder uh, and the great work of uh, Isaiah Berlin in documenting the history of ideas in Europe. Uh, in many sense, I think uh, Russell Ward represents a real Australian expression of romantic uh, nationalism. In another sense, though, I, uh, I came to it without even, I came to the book without perhaps knowing uh, that, I'd came, that I'd come to it. Uh, let me explain why. I, I went to school on a farm, as it were, uh, in southwest Sydney. A uh, bit odd, I, I grant you, but um, bear with me. Uh, it was an agricultural high school, uh, but a third of my classmates were boarders, and they came from country parts of New South Wales, uh, for the large part, from places like Orange and Wagga Wagga uh, and Goulburn. Uh, and uh, you know, I had to study agriculture for four years, so I know how to, for example, throw a sheep. I've shorn or sheared a uh, sheep. Uh, I've performed a, a manual pregnancy test on, uh, on a cow. Uh, uh, all the weird and wonderful things you get to do as, as, as a student in an agricultural school. Uh, but I never really understood, I don't think, uh, that kind of tradition uh, fully as someone who comes from a, a first generation uh, background as an Australian. Uh, you know, I went to primary school, for example, at a place where 90% of my fellow uh, students came from non-English speaking backgrounds, but um, there I was throwing sheep a few years later. Uh, let me say a few things about the relevance of, of the Australian legend. Now, there are a few books, I think, uh, that provoke as much debate uh, or disagreement as the Australian legend. And, uh, uh, I'm well aware that Stuart, for example, has, has written in the past a very powerful critique uh, of the Australian legend. It has no shortages of, there's no shortage of enemies when it comes to, to Russell Ward. He had a great spat with Humphrey McQueen uh, in the 1970s uh, that went on for, for decades. Uh, others have highlighted the various deficiencies and flaws of, of his argument in the book. Feminists will say, well, the Bushman myth, the, the Bush legend, uh, really leaves no room for uh, women. Uh, others would say that uh, Russell Ward never really dealt with racism or uh, the question of Indigenous Australia in any great length, and indeed he doesn't in this book. Uh, others still would write that the idea that an Australian national character was forged in the crucible of uh, pastoral Australias uh, is historically inaccurate, when in fact uh, people such as Patterson and Lawson wrote about the country from the cities. And there's a dark side as well, I think, to the kind of collective mateship that Russell Ward celebrates. Uh, there's a section in, in the book that, uh, I, that stuck out for me the first time I read it, and he refers in passing uh, to a British visitor, Alexander Harris, uh, and he talks about uh, stories that went around the, during the 19th century about socialist, the socialist orator telling his comrades that there will be strawberries and cream for everyone after the revolution. And the story goes that someone in the crowd kept on interjecting, saying that they didn't like strawberries and cream. <laughs> and the socialist orator would respond, well, comrade, after the revolution, you will have to like strawberries <laughs> and cream. Uh, and I think that sums up the, uh, the dark side of mateship, the conformity, the potential for uh, oppression uh, and assimilation. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a lot of resonance in the Australian legend, I think, in recent times, you've seen uh, an appropriation of it uh, in, in, in our national politics. Uh, Judith Brett has made, I think, a very persuasive argument that John Howard managed to appropriate the Australian legend very effectively during his prime ministership, whereas once 
It was the Australian left, the progressive side of politics that spoke the language of mateship. Mateship became effectively owned by the right. Now, I think I'll conclude by, by saying this about the Australian legend. We can't dismiss the Australian legend, whether you disagree with it uh, or not. And I think Russell Ward actually deserves a, a bit more credit than what some of his critics uh, would give him, because he, he understood quite well that he was talking not about national characteristics as they actually existed. He understood that he was engaging in an exercise of myth-making, in an exercise uh, of nation-building, in one sense. Uh, and I think it's important to understand the, the legend not as literal history, uh, but understand it in the sense of uh, myth existing as uh, story. Uh, but let me conclude with uh, some words from Ward himself. Uh, he says, it's generally agreed that without a distinctive national tradition, a people lacks co cohesion, balance, and confidence. It's usually assumed that in a young country like ours, inherited attitudes exert less influence than in an old one. The truth may be that because of its relative youth, our tradition is at once too dominating and too rigid that we tend compulsively to worship it as, so to speak, a fair though sacred cow. But nothing could be more thoroughly within a tradition than to give it a go, to venture boldly on new courses of action, so modify and even create traditions as the anonymous Bushmen and later the men of the 90s did. Today's task might well be to develop those features of the Australian legend which still seem valid in modern conditions. Uh, and I think, disagree with him or not, Russell Ward gave it a good go. And though the Australian legend may not be entirely valid, we can't dismiss some of its valid validity. Okay, there you go, folks. We have uh, our must-read histories tonight. Um, our books have been written by uh, a soldier with a droll wit, uh, a misogynist alcoholic, and the patron saint of Movember. So, um, we have about eight minutes left of our official time in our forum. Um, I've got lots of questions for the speakers, but I'm sure you do too, so I think we're going to throw it over directly to you. There are people with roving mics, so whack your hand up. And uh, no? Nobody's dying to ask a question of our speakers? Oh, I've got one up the front here. We'll go with that one. Um, is that on? Yes. Oh, this is a question for Professor McIntyre. I just, I wonder why a, you chose a historian who is a misogynist, and if the perspective of a, of a misogynist is actually a valid historical text, and why should it be on my must-read list? Well, thank you. Um, it, it doesn't have to be on your must-read list. Stuart, you might just have to uh, throw your yeah, microphone. I, I'm not suggesting it's on your must-read list. I said it's on mine. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would argue that Brian Fitzpatrick was no more a misogynist than was Russell Ward, if it came to that. I mean, um, there's a biography of, of Brian Fitzpatrick by Don Watson, which explores um, his two marriages and their dynamics. Um, I, essentially, I'm saying I think that there are a number of uh, ways in which Brian, Moore, uh, that Brian Fitzpatrick's values are not ours, um, and that's one of them. But he represents, he's quite close to Russell Ward, really, he's another radical nationalist, um, writing from a slightly different perspective, I think. Um, and essentially, I think, because that final paragraph that I read out still appeals to me. It is confronting when you hear you say something like, you know, two um, Fitzpatrick women were incidental. Um, and it is, uh, and it's certainly something that spurred the next generation of historians on. Hey. I mean, Anne Summers in her book, Damn Whores and God's Police, mm -hmm. the first line that she writes in that is, this is a, a history of Australia. But, you know, her point is hey. that it's not a history of women, it's about hey. Australia when you put the women back yeah. in. No, so I, I, certainly, I, you know, there's yeah. the, that, the, the two texts that you've chosen is the whole sort of raison d'etre for the revisionist 
Yeah, and indeed, I, I'm not suggesting that the lives of his two wives were incidental in any way at all. His first wife, who, and it was a very damaging experience for her, a brief marriage, was Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who became our first important academic female historian. Uh, his second wife, uh, Dorothy uh, Fitzpatrick, who taught for a number of years out at Monash University, I think had to suffer the consequences of marriage to him far more than Kathleen did. And I'm not diminishing the lives of either of them. I'm rather suggesting that um, Fitzpatrick treated them badly, and I don't want to pass over that or exonerate it. I rather want to suggest that he is trying to capture something about community life with all of its limitations. Can I jump in there too, yes, since I, I feel like Russell Ward's been implicated in the question as well. <laughs> he has been. <laughs> uh, as he has. Uh, look, I, I, I don't think anyone... Uh, well, I don't think Stuart... Um, he can correct me if I'm wrong here, is necessarily, and I'm not necessarily arguing that we should read uh, the books that we've chosen alone or in isolation, but I think it's, it's important not to have a blinkered view of history and not to rule out uh, works of history, even if one doesn't agree with it or even if they're offensive, uh, because it's important to have a dialogue uh, with, uh, with those you don't, ha you don't necessarily agree with. Um, I don't agree with a lot of what Russell Ward argues, but nonetheless I know that it has, his arguments have resonance uh, with a lot of Australians still, and it's important to grasp that so that you can argue with it, debate it, dissect it, demolish it if you wish. But it's important that you must read it and that you must get your facts right uh, and you, that you, you argue it on its own terms as well. There's another one up the front here. Hi, I was just fascinated that Stuart and Tim's books came out within a couple of years of each mm. other and were written by men from very, seems like different backgrounds, but was there something happening in history at that time that made that such an important moment? Were people re-evaluating? Uh, well, I'd, I'd briefly say, and Tim can give his view on it, that both of them are written in the shadow of the Cold War, which is marginalising the left, and at a time when the spread of suburbia and materialism of a new kind seems to be eroding the values that they're celebrating. So in both cases, I think they are trying to appeal to a powerful myth in the Australian past. And the passage that Tim read suggests that he thinks it needs to be reworked and made relevant. But they're very much responding to, this is the age of Menzies, um, in which um, um, the roaming share has been replaced by the uh, family with a mortgage. So, and, and they are responding to that. Hmm. Uh, I, I just said very quickly, I, I think, the Menzies years uh, do animate uh, a lot of the scholarship taking place uh, during the 19, 1950s. Uh, so there is this conscious attempt, I believe, on the part of the radical nationalist historians to try and craft this national story that doesn't depend on, on Britishness, that's uh, radical in the sense of being about ordinary people, and that's nationalist in being very anti-British uh, and pro-Australia, very distinctively uh, Australian, uh, and you know, if you want to draw a lineage or think about continuities, think of Paul Keating and how he thought of uh, Australian national identity. He very much, I think, falls into that tradition. Uh, I'd throw in as well one one uh, interesting thesis or hypothesis that, I, that I've read about uh, certainly Russell Ward's work, which is that it's animated as well by uh, mass immigration, uh, the post-war uh, waves of immigration. Uh, one scholar uh, the, uh, whose work I've read. Uh, draws a very interesting parallel between their a weird mob, uh, John O'Grady's, uh, or Nino Collotta's uh, book, uh, and the Australian legend, and about this attempt to try and inculcate uh, certain national characteristics that everyone could buy into. Can I say a feminist? Could I add something there? Yeah, I was going to... I think what's yeah. even worse than the misogyny is that some women aped those characteristics. You know, you can still see that, say, at football matches in Melbourne. <laughs> There's a question right up the back. Thank you to the three of you for your input into this conversation about our national identity and cultural heritage. I'd like to open up the conversation to this next generation that will be creating this new identity and culture. What do you suggest we need to be aware of as we write in the, the ever advancing journal of Australian history? <laughs> Okay. Well, it is certainly, um, you know, something that is a prominent feature um, of tonight. All the three books have been written uh, before 1960, and obviously a lot happens after that. I mean, is there, is there 
How, how would you, to, if I can add to that question, how would you reflect on history writing in the last 50 years for that next generation? Um, I've got an eye on Marcia, that. do you want to jump in here? And then we, we do have an eye on the time. Well, you see, I'm not an historian. I'm an anthropologist, so I don't, you know... I'm not going to theorise nationhood or, you know, how the nation can be advanced, but I'll tell you about an interesting book I read recently, uh, The Protectors by Stephen Gray. I think it's a new way of writing history. It's a new way of taking account of history. He's, in fact, a lawyer, um, a very good lawyer. Uh, and it's, you know, it's about living in Darwin and learning about the stolen generations in Darwin and meeting the people and learning about the people who, who incarcerated the children. It's a fabulous read. And he, you know, skips from family dinner to bus stop in Darwin to um, uh, various um, historical documents. And, you know, so I, I just, I don't think that there's any shortage of, of inventive, creative um, writers from all sorts of disciplines grappling with our history because, you know, well, as somebody has already noted, we might think that some of these 1950s texts, which I had to read, um, uh, are misogynist. Uh, let me say that, you know, for me, sorely disappointed as an Aboriginal person as well. But many people came later to correct uh, those readings of history. Um, and, you know, there's some wonderful, there are some wonderful works around, and I think all we, you know, it's a bit of a struggle to keep up with them. Well, interestingly, what you're saying, in a way, is that that new book that you're um, using as, as an example of the way forward in history writing actually borrows from anthropological methodologies, and that you're writing from inside, in many respects, rather than being a kind of, you know, the objective observer. Yes. If I can add something very quickly, I think there's a rich vein of debate and scholarship that can uh, exist uh, looking into the future on citizenship and democracy. I still think that uh, Australians uh, don't value uh, democracy in, in the way that they might value, say, a cultural lifestyle based on sun, sand and beach. And challenging that, I think, is very important when we debate uh, our sense of history and culture and identity. We are actually five minutes over our allotted time tonight, so I feel like we could probably keep this going. I think we're just warming up. Uh, but unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap it up. So I uh, invite you to thank our three speakers tonight. I'd also like to thank the Wheeler Centre for hosting this event this evening and I'd encourage you all to log on to History Speaks, see what you think about it and feed back to the producers of it and long may history keep speaking to us. <laughs>